it's nice to meet you. <laughs> and this is my assistant and good right arm, Figment. Wait till you see the new towns of tomorrow. Desert farms and floating cities, even colonies in space. Come on, Linda! Let's exercise! You see my friends! The computer makes life easier. <laughs> Saves me time and headaches too. <laughs> Bay number three reports successful deminiaturization of probe Foxtrot 817. W Station. Hello, my friend, and welcome to the WW Radio Show, your Walt Disney World Information Station. I am your host, Lou Mangello, and this is show number 486, and I'm here once again not only to help you have the best possible Disney vacation experience, but I also want to bring you a little bit of Disney magic wherever you are with the podcast, videos, blog, live broadcast on Facebook every Wednesday night, my books, audio tours, special events, and more. You can find everything over at www.radio.com. So I believe that Disney Springs has really evolved into a true destination in Walt Disney World, especially for locals and frequent visitors. The shopping and live entertainment really put the finishing touches on what I believe are some of the best dining experiences anywhere in Walt Disney World. And one of my personal favorites is, and has been, Morimoto Asia. So this week, I would like to invite you to dinner with me and some friends for a live review of a restaurant that I believe offers much more than what you might expect. I'll then have the answer to our last Walt Disney World trivia question of the week, and I'll pose a new challenge for your chance to win a Disney prize package. Then stay tuned. I'll have more information about upcoming WW Radio Meet of the Month special events, our D23 Expo event, your voicemails, and more. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's episode of the WDW Radio Show. Before we start the show, I want to let you know about not one, but two new events coming up in the next couple of months that I hope you will be able to join me for. First, we are just two weeks away from our WW Radio Double Dip Cruise on the Disney Dream. And as I normally like to do, I have a pre-cruise kickoff event the night before we depart. But this year, I got to thinking, which is dangerous, I know. But I also want to invite you, whether you are cruising or not, to join us. Because we are all one big, happy WW Radio family. So anyone and everyone, and yes, of course, kids too, is invited to join us. Thanks to our friends over at Mouse Fan Travel, we have reserved space over at Paradiso 37 in Disney Springs from 2 to 4 p.m. on Saturday, June 24th, for an afternoon of appetizers, fun, and who knows, there might even be a mystery prize or two. And your ticket's going to include a selection of appetizers, including nachos and chorizo and beef skewers and chicken quesadillas, a couple of non-alcoholic drink tickets, and more. To find out more and get your tickets, you can go to the events page at facebook.com slash WW Radio. I'll also post a direct link to it in this week's show notes. Please note that ticket sales end on Monday, June 19th. So if you want to join us, you have to get your ticket by Monday, June 19th. Again, all the details are on the Facebook event page. But if you can't make it there, hopefully you can join us for our next and the one that I'm really excited for event out in Disneyland on Monday, July 17th, which, as you know, just happens to be Disneyland's birthday. We are going to be out there for Disney's D23 Expo. Mouse Fan Travel and WW Radio have come together once again like a black and white cookie and have, are going to have a booth on the show floor on the Collectors Forum. I'll be broadcasting live throughout the event. We're going to have all kinds of uh, contests and prizes and interviews and special guests. But if you are going to be there and hopefully continuing to stay on Monday, June 17th, we have a very special event that I would love for you to take part in with us because I want you to help celebrate Disneyland's birthday with a quest, not like a Chevy Chase vacation, a quest for fun, but a real quest through the park for a chance to win a prize package that's going to include, but it's not limited to, 
a three-night stay in Walt Disney World or Disneyland. Now, you don't need to be a Disneyland expert or even aficionado because all you need to do is follow the clues, answer all or as many of the questions you can, and you might be crowned the winner of our first Disneyland quest. It's going to be a five-hour quest through Disneyland Park, so you only need a ticket to Disneyland. It's going to start at 10 a.m. on Monday, July 17th, end at a secret location at 3 p.m. Teams need to be comprised of two to four people, no solo teams, but I'm sure you can easily find a potential teammate or teammates by going to the event page and posting there. Registration is $55 per team and ends on Monday, July 3rd. Now, we're also going to kick off the event with a special breakfast at the ESPN Zone in downtown Disney at 7.30 a.m. Now, while this is optional, we need at least one team member to attend in order to pick up the registration packet and get some further instructions as well. Also, anybody is welcome to attend the breakfast, even if you are not playing or are part of a team. Again, the quest is going to run itself from 10 to 3 theme park admission is going to be required over to Disneyland Park. It's a great way to cap off a very exciting D23 Expo event which concludes the night before the quest. I have a full explanation of all the rules. I'll put a link into the show notes or go to facebook.com slash Radio. Click on the events and you will find all the details and a link to purchase your tickets there. Ticket sales are going to end on Monday, July 3rd. We do have a hard cap on that date because there are some things that we need to <clears throat> have in place uh, before the quest begins. If you have any questions, please post it on the events page over at facebook.com slash Radio. But I hope you, your family, your friends uh, get together and join us for what I promise is going to be a very fun, very exciting, and wait until you see some of the prizes that we have in store for you, if you are crowned winner of our first Disneyland quest, hope to see you there. If you have listened to the show for the past 10 years or for the past 10 weeks, possibly even for the past 10 minutes, you will find that I believe that food is... That food, theme park uh, attractions at Walt Disney World are what you do in between meals because food to me is as much of the experience when you come to Disney as it is going to the parks and enjoying the rides and the shows. In fact, I'm even... I, food, I think of like the opening scene from Oliver, like food, glorious food, Hot lo mein and sushi, and you can tell, <laughs> and you can tell by my hint to um, the type of food that I'm talking about that we are in Disney Springs, which I believe is now the fifth theme park at Walt Disney World, to uh, do a live dining review at one of not even my top ten. This is definitely in my top five restaurants at Walt Disney World, Morimoto Asia. I should have like the Frank Sinatra table in the corner because I'm here so very often. I am super excited that you, the listener, are joining me at the empty seat around the table with me, but I'm also very excited to welcome somebody new to the show. She is a food blogger, a food connoisseur, a, a longtime member of the WW Radio blog family team. There are so many other ways to describe her and what she does, but she, at the end of the day, is a foodie and a Disney enthusiast. She is Kristen Furman Simmons. So welcome. Thanks, Lou. I'm so excited to be here at Morimoto Asia. This is definitely a food theme park in itself. I'm just thrilled to eat here tonight. So we ate here. We had lunch here. Yes. <laughs> we had a lunch meeting here uh, yes. a, few, a few weeks ago. And as we were eating, I'm like, oh, we have got to come back and, and review this together because you don't just enjoy and savor and photograph your food the way I do. But this for you is really, sort of, it's kind of, you made it your job. Yes, I have. I mean, absolutely. I turned my passion and my vocabulary into something that I could could do as a writer. And now I actually teach food and culture too. So it's really exciting for me to share that passion and teach people not only how to taste, but enjoy food stories. I love what goes on behind the scenes in the kitchen. And I've worked also in the kitchen too. I used to work as a pastry chef. So I've been behind the line. I I feel like I've put in the blood, sweat, and tears behind Good Food, too. So it's really 
thrilling and I'm happy to be at Disney and I'm happy that they've sort of upped the ante in the past decade because it really suits a food person like me. Yeah, and, and we were here last time. You have an affinity and a love for Asian cuisine, much that I do, and I was like, oh, yeah, that's it. So we were planning on coming here together, yeah. just you and I, a cozy little table in the corner, and ordering together, and then I stopped and I thought for a second, which, as you know, is dangerous. I said, you know, if we bring more people, we can order more food. I love this plan. <laughs> this is a great plan. It's one of those things, and here's the thing. Everybody here has a story about their food and what they like and how they taste it and I think that's the richest part right that's why we're all together so <laughs> no I'm, I only invited them because I want to be able to order more food without being judged by the server so <laughs> <Judgment free zone. laughs> yeah. so back on the show once again uh, they are affectionately known as my family it is Deanna Marion and Nicholas so welcome hi hi my dad's job is eating food, and I'm proud of it. <laughs> Listen, guys, you can be whatever you want to be when you grow up. Just stay in school. I want to be a foodie when I grow up. <laughs> While you were sitting, you were sitting next to Kristen, so you are, this is going to be, I like this because it's going to be an educational opportunity as well. Food Critic 101. Exactly. Nice. Exactly. So we have, like I said, we have eaten here before, Kristen and I, my family and I have eaten here Numerous times as well. Uh, I think this is one of the Keystone restaurants here in Disney Springs, uh, along with a few other. Boathouse, you know, I still love you. But, um, I, you know, I remember being here when this was Mannequin's Dance Palace. But even when we came in, you know, we were just saying we love the, the there's an energy, there's a vibe here that sort of it feels like, you know, being in New York City, like in Chelsea or something. You forget that it used to be Mannequin's, but... It's a, it's a much more, it's a, it's a casual upscale type of restaurant. Yeah, and it's interesting. The first time I came here, so they're now t almost two years into being open. So they've gotten their groove. Their, the shakedown cruise is over. Um, great dishes are on the menu. And when I was first here, actually, Masahara Morimoto was sitting at this very table where we're sitting, educating his staff. And he's a very quiet, subtle guy. And he was here for two months on and off training his staff and he actually comes back periodically. I ended up riding the bus with him to the Magic Kingdom later that night. He does not take um, any type of special transportation. He uses Disney transportation and it's very common for people to see him riding the buses around town. He actually stays at the Poly, at the Polynesian, which is pretty interesting. But he was here and it was one of those things where he's really hands on with the, the continuing development of this restaurant. So, And that's one of the things I love. Um, I have seen him here a number of times because I love the fact that, like Homecoming across the street, he is not just a name on the marquee. He is, he is hands-on here all the time. And I was at, the first time I was here was when they did a media preview of the opening. And it was a, a very small group, and he was here. And I loved, they literally brought out the fresh tuna, and he was filleting the tuna right there. And they made what I think was the world's largest sushi roll. Like, where, from where we're sitting to the front door was a giant and I helped roll this giant sushi roll what an honor and they were forget the honor they were walking around handing it and nobody else was eating it and I'm like wait a minute there's all this fresh tuna sliced by mushroom Morimoto and I can have it <laughs> it was like I had a feeling that's what heaven was going to look like I, I absolutely agree with that. I've watched him. His knife skills are incredible, right? I mean, the knives he uses are so incredibly sharp. And I've watched him break down a tuna loin within, let's say, two minutes. And I'm like, what just happened here? It's an art form, right? It, yeah. It's a beautiful art form. That's his original skill set. He was trained as a sushi chef and then something called kaisake, which is basically it, you sort of evolve from sushi, hot and cold, um, spicy to sweet. And that's his that's his bread and butter, so to speak. So when you watch him do that, it's like watching magic happen. It is. And you can can see the amount of training that goes in to become a sushi chef. My father's um, appearance of Morimoto, Morimoto, heaven on earth. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. And, and so you made a good point, Kristen, because one of the things I, I make sure that I do is when a restaurant opens, I usually try not to review it for a, a, an extended period of time because I've been in the restaurant business before, you know, you've got to work out the kinks. When, when, when people go into a restaurant... The Saturday night that it opens, and they criticize the staff and the food. You can't. It's just not fair. You've got to sort of let them go through the motions. But um, I, I will tell you, knock on wood, I have not had a bad meal here. Yeah. The service has been exceptional. Um, they don't mind if I just sit and waddle my like. It takes hours to eat and waddle my way out. So, and I love the menu. Um, I, I love the fact that I think there's a little bit of something for everybody here. I don't think it's necessarily 
a, a scary menu. Yes, there is sushi. There are some things that might be um, potentially intimidating to non-adventurous eaters. Uh, giant, no, but Mar- the giant. It's it's Marion the the Morimoto Peking duck. They're like sitting like right there. I can see them. And well, that, but but that's what I love is that the display, the show kitchen being right there. You can see exactly what it is that you're about to eat. It's like a banshee. You connect with your duck. <laughs> I like that. You are right. So, what? Do, oh, hi. And this is Ashley, our server, who has been patiently waiting for us to. Uh, do you guys want to order some drinks or anything ahead of time first? Ladies first. So I'd like to have the Manhattan East, please. And it's a mixture of Junmai Sake, Maker's Mark, ginger liqueur, and orange bitters. It sounds fantastic. It sounds like it's a little bit of a twist on a Manhattan, um, and I love that. So we'll get that. So I'm going to order the Sake Sangria, which is, a, which is sake, light white wine, plum wine, Asian pears, apple, plum, and tangerine juice. A glass, please. Thank you. Mary? Um, what kind of boba tea do you have? Uh, right now, the flango is going to be a uh, passion fruit, and then we mix it with green tea. Mm. Is it a milk tea or is it like a normal? No, it's just the green tea with the tapioca balls. Yeah. Do you have Japanese soda? The Renune? Yeah, I have melon flavored. No one? Please have that. For you, sir? So this is a lot of pressure because you have an extensive uh, cocktail and beer and sake menu. Um, have you tried the Morimoto Rogue Beer um, collaboration? So he worked with Rogue Brewery out in Oregon. And I don't know if you're a beer fan. I love Rogue's Dead Guy Ale. And they, the uh, beer that they make here is outstanding. And it's actually served in this beautiful ceramic bottle. So that's something delicious. To, if people are into beers and if you're into craft beers, it's on the bitter side. But it's quite good. It may not be for tonight, but... So a sake... Fl- um, so you know what? I actually like the uh, the Morimoto signature sake is the, the Junmai. So I'll have a, a Junmai sake, please. Can I hang on to this? Great, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, before we even get into the menu, the, the it is a two-sided... The, the cocktail, wine, and beer menu here is as large as the full menu yeah. in some other restaurants. Um, they have classic cocktails. They have seasonal cocktails. They have a number of non-alcoholic drinks as well, like a Blushing Dragon that has ruby red grapefruit and lychee juice, Pacific Sunrise, lavender cocoa lemonade. They have a Mori Motini, uh, Japanese vodka and Junmai Sake, a White Lily, and I'm probably butchering this the, the, these words completely. Why aren't you doing it? You probably say so it, you know what's really interesting I learned about pronouncing things in Japanese? There aren't a lot of um, accents the same way that we say things, so it's like... Shirayuri, like you instead of like Shirayuri, you don't stress that last syllable. You say it all in one. It's and it makes it really difficult because I'm not practiced in that, right? <laughs> so they have the Shirayuri White Lily, which has sudachi shochu, kalpiko, and yuzu served with a twist. I actually have no idea what some of those ingredients are. It sounds fantastic, and I bet you anything. If we order it, it would be quite good, and we can ask our server what that is. You know that the mango matcha punch has green tea, vodka, mango, and lychee. That might be something to to, to get just yeah. just for giggles later on, but yeah, it is an a um, it's an extensive um, collection. I have had the sake the sake flights before, and there's a there's a, a very wide. I mean, there's probably five ten. There's probably twenty or so different sakes that you can try. And it's interesting, like the varieties that they have here are great for sake beginners. Um, it's one of those things where they will give you tastes here, which is lovely. So if you're not ready to commit and you're kind of dipping your toe into the sake pool, so to speak, they will give you tastes if you want to have them before you get the full uh, the full portion of it, which is lovely. And they have so many different varieties. So they have the fruity varieties up top, the more kind of, I wouldn't say bitter, but a little bit more astringent kinds in the middle. So you can really, whatever taste profile you like, you can ask for that. I love it. And so for those people who don't know, what what is sake? So sake is rice wine, and it's it have different types of fermentation, and usually the yeast is actually what influences the flavor of the sake per se. So a lot of sakes have proprietary yeasts that they use that have different flavor profiles. It's a really interesting process. And then of course the barrels that they're aged in as well give flavors to the sake. And you can have informal sake, something that's more like akin to a Bud Light or something that's <laughs> more like a Veuve Clicquot. So it's really it's dependent upon the process as well as those proprietary yeasts. And a lot of people actually are really proud of 
like the yeast that they're like, oh, our particular valley where this sake is made has this one type of yeast, and they can't brand it anywhere else. So it's yeah, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, I saw. I was watching a, a, a documentary on Netflix about yeah. the making of. Sake. I actually love the unfiltered sake, yes. the, the cloudy sake. Oh, yeah. um, when we go to our secret ja- our secret Japanese uh, sushi restaurant, that's usually what I'll order. Nice. So, what do you like about the unfiltered? Um, I, I don't know. I like the, the texture of it. Um, it's it's not too. Smoother. It's, it's smooth. definitely smoother. It's not sweet. It's, it's not overly not sweet. Sweet, but right. the but the texture of it is definitely smoother right. than the normal sake. So I think that's what we both enjoy the most about it. Absolutely. I think that when you filter out, you know, some of those particles in it, you get that more astringent, sometimes like burning heat, right? And so when you have it unfiltered, it is smooth. It's lovely, and it's more of a sipping kind of a drink, right? Yeah. And so correct me if I'm wrong. The proper way to drink sake. Is not hot because when you hot, when you drink hot sake, it takes away some of the, the flavor. Well, right. I mean, hot sake, it's like serving wine ice cold. You cover up the flavor, right? So when you serve, you can serve bad wine ice cold and everybody will drink it. If you have hot sake, now some people like that and that's fine. Um, but you really want to be able to have the flavors of the sake come through. So you'll have it at room temperature. That's really the best way to go. All right. I think enough talk. We need to start walking the walk and let's crack open the, gi- the ginormous two-page menu. There are sushi, small plates, dim sum, soup, salad, meat, poultry, noodles, rice, fish, and vegetables, as well as the signature spare ribs and Peking duck, which we will uh, come back to a little bit. So you being the food expert, when you see, when you see this menu sort of go you know, left to right, top to bottom, however you, give me your first impression. Yeah, so I look at it right now, and knowing Morimoto's history and his um, his skill set and background, you definitely have to jump into the sushi. You have to go for it. I mean, I think that some of those dishes, these are all sort of, I would say, entry-level sushi dishes. There's something that, if you're not a sushi fan, you can really try and get a good flavor for. The things that are jumping right at me, I mean, I love the eel. They're, they have this thing called the sushi and sashimi pagoda, which probably looks fantastic. It's chilled whole lobster, oysters on the half shell, shrimp cocktail, nigiri and sashimi. So it's nigiri if you're looking at a hand roll, sashimi, uh, which is just the fresh cut fish in itself. Um, and there's all kinds of small plates here. They have dim sum as well. So really, this is the, the side of the menu that I want to start with to get some great flavor. But when you see something like the pagoda yeah. or the imperial, which is which serves two to three people or four to six that's really more of a suggestion. I mean, I don't think they would judge me oh if I ordered God. one on my own. Absolutely not, right? <laughs> so, okay. I love ramen. Like, ramen is great. You just get it, you make it, you're done. So they have ramen here that's like regular ramen, but better. So I think I'm going to get, like, the cool person ramen. It's the tonkatsu ramen. It's by Noodles and Rice. What's in, it? What's in it? It's rich pork broth, egg noodles, roasted pork, soy marinated egg, wood ear mushroom, and pickled ginger. So, you know, that sounds great. It's just like fancy people ramen. Right, because the ramen here is not like the 79 cent ramen you buy in the grocery store. You break up and you, you cook on the stove. Even though that's the, good, too. That's good, too, in a pinch. And when you go to college... So, uh, looking at the menu from your side, left to right, anything in the sushi roll area that jumps out at you? So, I'm not going to talk about the ribs because we're talking about sushi. But I'm not going to talk about the ribs because we're talking about sushi. But anyway, the ribs. No. Okay. <laughs> we're talking about sushi. Okay. So, so one of my favorite things is a spider roll. So, I love soft shell crab. Um, so, I am going to probably start off with the spider roll. Which is tempura, soft shell crab, spicy mayo, cucumber, and asparagus. Right. And also get some ribs. <laughs> yeah, I think the spider roll too. Like I grew up in Maryland, and soft shell blue crabs, which is what these are, are my absolute favorite. It's delicious. It's the crunch. It's the softness. I love the lovely flavor of the crab. I'm with you. So we're in the same camp. The same All right. So let's think. Let's think appetizer wise. Let's think about getting some sushi, some small plates, and some dim sum. And again, for people who are, who see who have heard the term dim sum, what exactly does that mean? Sure. It actually means touches the heart. So it's food that is something that you love, and it should be in a small package. And it's actually meant as a snack food. They have it here on the menu to dine with, but the term itself, a lot of people eat dim sum as an afternoon snack. And they have all kinds here. So they have the pork bao. 
Um, and if anybody knows bao buns, it's that wonderfully soft, steamy, white, pillowy, marshmallowy bread. Um, and they have uh, the steam buns, which are they have the kakuni pork bao um, with braised pork belly, lettuce, and spicy mayo, which I've had, and those go down way too easily. And they also have the chicken bao, so if you're more into teriyaki chicken, you can try it that way. So those are something that I'm definitely looking at. I'm also looking at the classic eel and avocado, which I love eel. I love eel sushi. It's something that we actually have in Maine. We, we are one of the largest eel fisheries in the world. The Japanese buy a tremendous amount of our eels. So I'm like, oh, I bet you anything these eels are probably from Maine. All right, so I think we should go. Why don't we get a spider roll, an eel avocado roll? Nicholas, anything on the left side of the menu jumping out at you that you're, you're thinking? Uh, on, the, on the appetizer side of the menu? Marion, anybody? I, I like dumplings really a lot, so I, I think the dumplings look really good. So we want to get some pork dumplings. So we'll get eel avocado, spider, pork dumplings. Ladies, anything else? I think that that's good. I love dim sum, so the dumplings sound really good. Anything else? Should we get anything else? The bao buns. Let's get. I think we should get to yeah. Yeah, let's get the the, the pork bao buns because those are like meat butter in a marshmallow roll. I can't even describe it better than that. I was thinking that too. I'm like, oh, is it just me that wants to order something else? No, no, no. It's all good. Okay, so we've got our appetizers uh, set. Do we want to start thinking about the full menu yet, or do we want to? I mean, as long as we're going to go in, we might as well go, go all the way in. The go, yeah. look, there's no joke. The ribs. All right, so we're going to get. So there's. Why don't we get a we get a half rack of rib, and we'll get Mary's going to get a ramen. Have you seen anything, Deanna, on the menu that jumps out at you specifically? So, I'm just going to get the ribs. I'm getting, so get tell me what, tell me why you like these ribs because I feel like they are a special. They're such a special dish that everybody that has them gets transformed. Why do you like them? So it's there's something really interesting the way they cook them. It it has this almost like this crispy coating over the top of the rib and once you bite into it the meat literally just falls off the bone so you don't even need to pick it up you can use a knife and a fork because it comes right off the bone when you eat it and the sauce that they put on it is absolutely it's just it's um i'm gonna say it wrong hoisin sweet chili glaze and it's just it's decadent and i'm a rib connoisseur so i love Usually any kind of ribs, and I could tell you very quickly if it's going to be succulent and tender or if it's going to be one of the ones that you need like a a chainsaw for. (laughs) But (laughs) the ones here, you definitely don't need that. So she just brought over our cocktails. Nicholas has his um, melon flavor ramune, which if you've seen this maybe in the Japan Pavilion in Epcot, it's a glass bottle that has a little plunger on top that you pop the the ball into it. So Marion, what did you order? Okay, so I'm a really big fan of boba tea or like bubble tea, which is like little tapioca pearls and like a, like just like a tea or like a milk tea, which is just tea with milk, obviously. Um, and they have one here on the kids menu actually. That's um, I think it's strawberry or passion fruit tea. It doesn't say on the menu, but it's like it's like seasonal. No, she just told me it's like a different one. Um, I think it's strawberry like green tea. And these aren't regular tapioca pearls. They're kind of like the boba that you would get on, like, frozen yogurt. So they explode when you, like, chew them. It's really good. It's not too sweet, which I was worried about. It's not too sweet, and the tea is just normal, and then the boba just, like, explodes. Just, like, flavor of fruit goodness. Yeah, that's it. All right, so ladies, have you tried your cocktails as yet? First of all, cheers. Cheers. Welcome to our table, all of you, all of you who are listening. Kids. So, Deanna, got you will go first. And you, what did you order? I ordered the sake sangria. Oh, it's delicious. It's very refreshing. Not too sweet at all, which I actually enjoy. Um, and you get, you do get, taste the hint of sake, which is very subtle. It's lovely. I would say the same with this. I mean, it's not sake forward, but it definitely, like, I can taste the bourbon and then the sake next. And then a little bit of the ginger. It's beautifully layered. It's a very light cocktail, perfectly, you know, wonderful for a day like this where it's hot outside. So if you are a fan of a Manhattan and sort of associated as a winter drink, you can drink this drink all year round if you drink it this way. It's fantastic. So I ordered the uh, Morimoto Signature Sake, which is a a Junmai sake, which is, um, it's very clean. It's very light. It has a, a really nice 
finish to it. Um, very, very easy to drink. I'm actually cheating because I'm using some of the terminology that they're... That no, they, you should have cheat. <laughs> so one thing I love about the menu is they say under some of the sake, is they, they help describe... Yeah. You know, it's like when you order a wine, um, you know, does it taste like dirt? Does it taste like leather? Well, it tells you it's clean and bright. It has a delicious finish. But it is. It is a very um, light uh, sake. Um, it's very smooth. There's no um, bitterness or anything on the back of the palate. So one of my friends told me a really good tip, especially if you're sort of new to describing flavors of your drinks. Always lead with fruit and spice. And you can't go wrong. It's one of those things where if those are the notes that hit you first, and you'll always sound competent if you lead with fruit and spice, right? And it makes you feel good. You're like, oh, this tastes, I can taste the ginger, I can taste the orange. And that's a lovely way to get into your drink. I mean, of course, there are trained sake professionals that can tell you all of the different tasting notes like tobacco, leather, biscuit, all of these things, right? Which is not, I mean, unfortunately, I don't have that kind of... of repertoire yet, um, but it's a great way for anybody who's into describing their drinks to go with those two things first, because then that makes you feel good, and you can really, you can sound professional as well as drink well. You know, it has a playful hint of citrus with a, <laughs> a light, smooth, like a light spiced finish. Um, I don't even know what I'm saying, but it's delicious, and I, I, I am not really a, um, I'm not really a much drinker, but this is really nice, um, whether you come here and just have some appetizers, or if you're coming here for a full meal. Hi. So, Ashley, we are ready to order our first round of multiple rounds of food. We're going to have um, an eel avocado roll, please. White or brown rice? Uh, white or brown rice, any preference? White rice, please. a girl. There you go. Um, a spider roll. A, what do we say? We're going to get pork dumplings. And a, which, which do you want? The, the, let's get the kukuni pork bao. Kukuni pork bao. Is that enough? Yeah, so we got the eel roll, we got the spider roll, the pork dumplings. Oh, yeah, yeah and the kukuni pork bell. That's perfect. And some edamame, please. I mean, if it happens to fall onto the tray, so be it. And we'll start with that. That's <laughs> great. Thank you. I actually saw edamame being served at Animal Kingdom, and I loved that. I saw it, kids walking around with edamame as a snack, and it was a wonderful thing that I saw as an alternative. You know, you, I love to see fresh fruit in the parks, but edamame made me very happy as kids were walking around um, because it's so easy to eat and it's incredibly healthy. And we love, as a family, we all love edamame. And actually, we have like dried, we have those dried edamame snacks at home too. Well, I think the interesting thing too now is in most of the restaurants and in most of the parks, all of the healthy options that they do have. So on the up and con coming and with everything changing. The Thule Canteen is a great example. So yeah. people are so much more health conscious these days, especially for their kids. And, you know, a lot of people are eating organic. But the, the fresh fruit options, you know, in Magic Kingdom, I always love the pickle option. You go to that little place in the middle and you can order one of those delicious, yummy pickles. And it's such a wonderful thing to see kids, just as you said, with the anamame and fresh fruit. They have those, they have those pineapple sticks in Animal Kingdom, which are so refreshing in the afternoon, especially on a hot day. So I think the options, and Disney has done a wonderful job with the options for healthy eating for uh, adults as well as children. Oh, absolutely. And if pineapple just happens to be covered in dark chocolate, so be it. Right. I, I may have seen pineapple covered in chocolate and caramel today in the Germany Pavilion, but it's all good. I mean, I was we were reflecting on that fact where coming to Disney in the 70s, right, where fresh fruit was fruit cup at the time, right? I mean, that's what we all ate. And how much over the past 40 <coughs> years that I've been coming to the parks um, that that's changed and where my kids feel like they have that option where, again, that pineapple skewer is going to refresh you so much more and keep that energy up, which is what you need to be able to sustain yourself. All right, so let's quickly just go through the menu. And I want to just touch back on, so for people to know, again, I'll post photos of the menu in the show notes, but the when I said that you can come in here and get a number of appetizers to share, you most absolutely can do that because they do have an extensive appetizer menu. There's spicy tuna, spicy yellowtail, spicy salmon, California eel avocado, shrimp tempura, vegetable spider rolls, as well as um, sushi and sashimi combos and towers. In addition to the edamame, they also have uh, kanakama rangoon, which is a crab meat and cream cheese spring roll with a really nice sweet chili sauce. Key West shrimp tempura, chicken wings with a, a spicy garlic soy glaze, which are really nice. Tuna pizza, and yes, I've eaten 92% of these. Hamachi tartare, which, uh, and a turo tartare, as well as the uh, other items on the dim sum. I like the shumai, too. I, too on the I, like the I thought about it. 
I thought about it. I did. They go down very easily. They're so small and delicate, and little. Sh- they're like the little shrimp that are inside, and they're very easy to eat the entire thing yourself. So you just have to be careful. Let's see how quickly we tear through the rest. But let me just quickly take you through the right side of the menu, and then we'll sort of go through it in a little bit more detail. They have a number of different soups. They have a miso soup uh, and a hot and sour soup. Under the meat and poultry, there's an orange chicken, which I don't know if anybody's planning on ordering. I've had it before. It's not your grandmother's orange chicken. It is not anywhere close to what you'll get at your local Chinese restaurant. It's a tempura chicken with Chinese broccoli, wok toss with a sweet Florida orange sauce. Nicholas, you and I have had this before, right? We came here. We actually, And here's a, a tip, too. If you don't want to sit outside or can't get a seat upstairs or can't get a reservation, you could sit in the bar in the lounge area and order off the full menu, which is what Nicholas and I did. The orange chicken, it's, it's not like other orange chicken where it's not, it's not really chicken that tastes like orange. It's more of like a sweet kind of like teriyaki kind of feel but it's an like you can actually taste the orange flavor in the orange chicken and it was really light too it's such a light fry on the outside it's not a very heavy meal at all it's like the ribs the flop the fry is perfect and the chicken like finish it all yeah right we're talking about you know we're talking about the ribs and the orange chicken two things that you think that you get you know forgive me for you like you go to the mall and you can get orange right. chicken and ribs. It is not like that at all. Right. My, my daughter, who's 11, actually ordered the orange chicken the first time she was here. And I asked her, I said, honey, can I have a bite of that? And I ended up eating half of her dish. It's light. It's crispy. The orange sauce has a, it has a little bit of the orange peel in it. And it's incredibly addictive. It was beautifully executed. I mean, we were talking about the way that they fry things here. It's so quickly done at a high temperature that you get that lovely crisp shell on the outside of things. It's outstanding. I'm starving, by the way. The other thing, too, is that, you know, you think Morimoto and you think sushi. Right. Okay, so the, that's the first thing you're going to think when you come here. So I think, you know, as a foodie, people need to know that Morimoto has so many more signature dishes here other than just the sushi. And just like you had said, they have some great, you know, opening dishes with regards to if you are in a sushi connoisseur and you want to try it for the first time. But... Some of his signature dishes here are absolutely fa- magnificent. So. For example, the Kung Pao chicken, oh. Mongolian filet mignon, uh, barbecue, so L.A. barbecue kalbi, which is marinated and grilled boneless short ribs, house kimchi, and gochujang sauce. I probably butchered that. No, you're good. All right. Japanese A5 wagyu beef. Three-ounce minimum suggested portion wagyu beef. You know, and, Are you a Wagyu beef fan? Oh, sister. Right. It's like the melt-in-your-mouth beef. It's like more fat than it is actual muscle. It's so good. And because people sometimes will see them in the menu and go, oh, it's just, you know, it's a, um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a novelty type of thing. But Wagyu beef, I mean, there is a distinct difference in the taste. You know if you're eating Wagyu beef versus... You know, even versus filet mignon. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's more than just fork tender. It has this kind of unctuous quality to it, and it's it's melting, right? That's the kind of thing that I, I describe it. It's meltingly delicious meat. You still have to cut it, right? It's one of those things where you still have to use your knife to get through it. But at the same time, once you eat it, you have that little bit of a, a meat pause. It's a meat dream, really, right? <laughs> where you stay there and you're like... <laughs> Everything else in the world goes away, and all you think about is the delicious flavor of this meat. And what's nice, you know, and and a number of the items here on the menu, you know, presentation, especially from what I understand in Japan, you know, the sushi, and, and we, we, we start to consume with our eyes first, and presentation is everything. They serve this table side over a grilling stone with a peppercorn sauce, and the A5 is the highest quality given only to the finest beef from Japan. So you know that when you order Wagyu beef here, it's real Wagyu beef as opposed to Wagyu beef at the food court. Right, exactly. It's one of those things where it's it's flown in specifically. I mean, the price point, it's one of those things where it's $23 per ounce right now. Um, and yes, that's a little bit high. However, it really is a treat. And if it's one of the if, if you're going to eat Wagyu beef, this is the place to do it. Yeah. There's a little tiny part of me that's <laughs> That's it. The other thing I want to touch upon, Lou, is, is the, the, the opportunities for children. I actually forgot that our kids were here. I was so consumed with the menu. <laughs> so the things that they have on the, the choices of entrees for the kids is a Morimoto macaroni and cheese. Okay, so it sounds delicious. Yellow and white cheddar with a panko crust. I mean, lovely. I'm going to say this wrong. Carange drum, drumpets. 
Authentic Japanese style juicy fried chicken. Okay. Okay. Lo mein. Butter tossed Cantonese noodles, steamed vegetables, and it's called Bow Wow. Beef hot dogs, which I think it's one of those. Um, the bao bun. The bao bun. It is. Right? It is. It's it's too much. It's one of those things where I actually saw bao buns at my grocery store after seeing this hot dog, and I was like, kids, we're going to grill hot dogs and have bao buns with it. It was perfect. I was like, it's going to be just like Morimoto. Yeah. And this, again, goes back to the opportunities for children, other than just the macaroni and cheese and a hamburger or chicken fingers. And, you know, once you expose your children to something different, nine times out of ten, if you expose them enough to different things, they're going to enjoy them. So, you know, order something from the children's menu that you normally wouldn't order and have your child try it while you're out because, you know, you're out to a nice restaurant, you want to have a nice meal. I mean, my kids, we have them all over the world, all over the country, and they'll try something at least once, and 90% of the time, they'll actually like it. Which is disappointing to me because I hope that they won't, so there's more for me, but my kids have become food, because we introduce them to a lot of different foods where it let them decide what they like and what they don't like. You can hear that in the way that your kids describe food and engage with it. I, I love that your philosophy because it's one of those things where if they don't have a chance to try they're never going to know that they like it I mean it's the same thing with us I'm curious to ask when did you all get into sushi yourselves I mean sushi wasn't something that I had until I was a teenager right it was not part of our regular repertoire and once my parents introduced me to it I mean that was it right and it's wonderful because now our kids are they're connoisseurs at 11 and 14, right, where it took me until I was 18 to really get into this kind of food. So my sushi... Oh, hello. Oh, wait a minute. My sushi store got interrupted with, with buns and bao and... Thank you so much. Oh, look at that. Now, you know the rule. No, no touching until we photograph it. <laughs> Right? You can't, we're not allowed to eat anything until we actually uh, and photograph it. Yes, exactly. Unless it was on Facebook. So while I do this, why don't one of you guys take some photos of the food? And I'll, tell, and I'll quickly tell my sushi story. Because back when I was practicing law with, in a firm with my dad back in, so this is, I, I clerked until 95. So this is probably 96, 97. We would go out to lunch together every day. Um, and there was a Japanese restaurant that we had never been to before, not far. We had never had sushi before. And she brought out the sushi menu. And we're like, all right. You know, my dad was like, come on, let's just all. So we're like, he's like, oh, let's try a thing of tuna. I'm like, yeah, I'll get one too. He's like, let's try the shrimp. Yeah, I'll get one of those too. And we didn't know that when he ordered a roll, it came out in like pieces of eight or pieces of whatever. So they bring out this ginormous boat to our table <laughs> filled with $320 worth of... Like, nobody stopped us and say, Sir, are you sure you're going to eat all that? Which is kind of what they do to me now when I order. Um, so we didn't finish everything, but we got a chance to try it all. Um, and, you know, we're sort of adventurous. You know, my dad liked the giant clam, and he oh, yeah. liked the... the um, uh, he liked some of the other things that um, maybe were not... You know, for me, but... Um, like octopus? Like, Are you an octopus? No, like, when, when I was a kid, octopus was one of those things where I looked at it, I saw the tentacle on yeah. the top of the, the ball of rice. I was like, no way. Now that I'm 40-plus years old, I love it. Right? Do you eat uni? I love it. Yeah. I love it. And it was one of those things that <laughs> uni for a long time was like, ooh, it tastes like soap. But as my tastes matured, as we say, um, I now love it. And I, I think it's a great flavor. But it was one of those things I watched my parents order it, and I was like, I'm never going to eat that. And yet here I am. So... So, Chris, let me just tell you, um, at this table, you go shy, you go hungry. Because look at these vultures. No, no, like Don't a, wait for any. Just dig cool. right in. So, when I first tried calamari, I didn't know it was actually squid. So, I'm like, oh, this is good. This is great. Oh, what's this little tentacle thing? And eh, whatever. It tastes great. And then I eat it. And my dad's like, oh, I'm so happy that you like squid. I'm like, oh, this is squid? Okay, I'll just keep eating it. And it was, like, I'm really happy that I didn't know what it was. Then I probably wouldn't have tried it and now like I love calamari because I'm Italian so yeah Nicholas how's your how's your dumpling really really good it's nice and like the beef the beef or whatever whatever magical meat mystery meat is inside is a nice tender and like the like dough on the outside is like a nice soft dough and it like melts in your mouth it's so good 
far so good? So far so awesome. So it was interesting. I took my daughter, my oldest daughter, to a, um, a dumpling class in Boston. And I didn't realize that all of these dumplings have different names for the way that they're folded. And this one now that I know is Standing Half Sun. And then there's also Standing Half Moon. Um, but it's beautiful the way that these <laughs> dumplings are folded. And it was one of those things that I sort of took for granted. And when you're doing, uh, when you're making dumplings yourself, you realize how amazing it is when these people are doing it by hand. And these are actually, these dumplings here at Morimoto are made by hand, which is lovely. A lot of places buy their dumplings frozen. And these are actually, you can see the fact that they're pleated um, and crafted by someone personally, which is lovely to see. Uh, and Nicholas was absolutely right. It does melt in your mouth. Back to the sushi story. Believe it or not, the first time I ever had sushi was with my husband. Oh, nice. And so he said, do you like sushi? And I said, I, I don't really think I even told him that I didn't ever have it. Oh. So we went out for sushi, and he and we ordered. he ordered a whole bunch of stuff, and I just ate it all. And Again, to my disappointment, I was hoping she wouldn't have liked it, but... <laughs> so, I feel like this was a very good date test, right? I mean, it's one of those things that divides the wheat from the chaff. Exactly. So right. it was the make or break deal, you know? I mean, I didn't kind of... I don't think I even told him I never had it. I think he just said, we're going for sushi, and I just kind of showed up. So, yeah. so those dumplings... Oh, yeah. Uh, you know what I like about it? It, it? Sometimes you get dumplings, and they're very doughy. Right. And they're sort of very mushy. It's like having a marshmallow on the outside of, of the meat. Right, and these are actually more like, the best way to describe it is like a dough skin, right? The, it should be sliced very thin. The, they, when they make the dough, they actually make a long cylinder, and they use one of these <laughs> unbelievably intimidating, sharp Japanese knives to slice off a tiny skin to the dough, and then they put in about a teaspoon of that pork, mi- pork mixture inside. What was cool about this, too, and I, you could taste it, they warm the pork up when they're, they're mixing it raw so that the fat gets released from it. And what happens with that fat, it act, ends up acting like glue. So you get that tighter meatball flavor when you when you bite into it. It's not like falling apart everywhere. It has a really great structure. So it's really, it's lovely. You can tell they're handmade. And you know what I love about your descriptions? Not only are they well thought out and incredibly descriptive and intelligent, but it gave, they're long, so it gave me time to eat <laughs> my kakuni pork. <laughs> oh. oh, my God. Again. Isn't that so good? Okay, so I kind I kind of got it, and it looked like there was like a cake wrapped around my meat, and I'm like, oh, that's great. Oh, sorry, a bao bun, and I tried it. It's like having like a piece of that rib that's like really really good, in like this like sweet like bread dough roll taco thing, and it's really good. I agree. <laughs> Well, because you know what you love about it? It's that it's that fatty pork belly, right? Like you said, Chris, like the fat is where all the flavor really comes meat from. Meat butter. It's meat butter. It's I, I don't I don't know if everybody's familiar with what pork belly is. I mean, I know a lot of people are, but basically it's the same cut of meat that they make bacon from, except that instead of curing it and smoking it, it's pressed and cured, and they render some of the fat out, and then they can do a lot of different applications with it. Like, this was rendered and then um, pan-fried, and then put in a gorgeous soy-based sauce on the outside, so you get the salty, the fatty, the sweet, like, all the things that you ever need in life are in that bun. Yeah. It's like the perfect little handwich to sort of use an old enthusiasm. So I always joke with Lou because the reason why I say to him, I run so much is so I can eat so much. Okay? I run, I run exactly. And, you know, there's something when you say to someone, pork belly, it kind of brings a calm to your soul. Okay? <laughs> because it's that delicious. You run because you eat. I not because I uh, eat. Okay. I'm kind of in the middle. I'm in the middle of those camps. But I do like the idea when you say pork belly. There's a certain sort of zen quality to it, right? It just really it's delicious. Like comfort food. It is comfort food, right? It's the same thing where all of those flavors give you that pause, and that's the kind of food that I like, right? Like where you get to forget about everything else that you're eating, and you're just focusing on the sensation and the flavor together. All right, let's quickly go through the rest of the menu. I'm still so starving. The Morimoto Peking Duck is front and center. It is it is meant for two. It's $27 per person. It's a carved house-roasted whole duck with steamed flour pancakes, apricot sweet chili, and hoisin miso. Um, 
again, they are hanging in the show kitchen. Now, have you ever had the duck here before? I have had the duck here before. And it's, again, same thing where they bring it to you gorgeously sliced so you get the crispy skin and you get the fat underneath and then the meat. And for people that aren't familiar with duck, duck can be incredibly fatty if it's not rendered out properly. And this, because they've hung them, um, a lot of that fat is rendered out. You still get the fat for the flavor, but it's crispy, and they serve it with a beautiful chai of pancake, and it just is, is really lovely to eat, especially to share with the table. I think I just heard someone say duff, and I thought of duff beer from The Simpsons. No, it's duck. Duck. Uh, they also have a number of fish items. They have a braised black cod, a sweet and sour crispy branzino, which is a Mediterranean sea brass, uh, angry lobster chow fun. I've never met an angry lobster before, but it's a whole lobster wok fried with sautéed flat rice noodles, Chinese vegetables, a spicy coconut curry sauce. Hello. Oh my, yeah, yeah. Uh, if you do not partake of the meats, they have a number of vegetable dishes. They have wok sautéed Chinese vegetables, portobello mushroom fries, and, and they also steamed vegetables. I am... Um, listen, again, this body doesn't happen naturally. I'm a carb guy. I see noodles and rice. I get excited. Yeah. There are nine different noodle and rice dishes. There's a beef lo mein, which, again, is not like your Chinese restaurant lo mein. Singapore laksa noodles, which is a creamy coconut and spicy curry. Rice noodles, a chicken meatball, a soy marinated egg. Morimoto shrimp pad thai, which I love. Yeah. Spicy chashu pork ramen, which I love. Duck ramen, which I have not tried yet. Tonkatsu ramen, which is a pork broth, Morimoto chicken fried rice, which is a mound. It's a it's, it's a house full of tough fried rice. And if you are a fried rice fan or if you get scared of other things on the menu, if you just have that one dish, it's outstanding. And they actually put a little bit of the hot sauce on the side of the dish so that if you have somebody who wants to eat it with you that loves hot, they can add it in. But if you don't like it, you don't have to touch it at all. So they don't add that heat in there. You can It's something that you can add in later. I like the gomoku fried rice because it has not just the chicken, but duck, pork, shrimp, vegetables, and the spicy house sambal sauce. That is some of the best fried rice I've ever had. It's like land and sea and sky and water and all the things together. It's like they just walked through the entire kitchen and took something from every little plate. And there's also Morimoto Buribap, which is a Korean-style yellowtail rice bowl served in a hot clay pot finished with egg yolk prepared tableside. I've had that before where they actually have the yellowtail on top and then they cook it against the side of this sort of this, uh, this, this um, steaming hot clay pot. Yeah, and it, buribap is a riff on bibimbap, which is the Korean dish just for mixed rice. So typically it has meat with it. And I think that the, the intention was, because he's so fish and sushi focused here, that they put the buri on top of it here as a little bit of his own personal take on bibimbap. And if you're a fan of, it's the same thing, if you're a fan of fried rice and mixed rice in any form, and then you like a little bit of the sushi, this is definitely the dish for you. All right, so I think we need to get a, a number of things yeah. and share. So... Morimoto spare ribs, it's a given. Yeah, right. What else did you, when you look at this menu, excites you? And everything is a perfectly acceptable answer. I think we definitely need to try the buribap. I think we need to go for that because I think the Korean flavors are absolutely delicious. And then the fish, too, is, is delightful. And I think we need to get the gomoku fried rice because we've talked so much about it. What are you, what are you thinking, ladies? Anything? Uh, okay, so I'm thinking. We know you, you know the ribs. Right, I got right. So you can pass me. And Marion had, I think, had already. Marion, have you? Getting the ramen because it has oh. ramen in it. You know that I'm gonna get it. So. Sweet. We're gonna get a couple of extra right. chopsticks and. But we, we probably have to get some. What's Nicholas want? Ramen. Nicholas wants a ramen too. Is he getting a different one? I hope. He has to because that's the rules of the game. So maybe we should. Oh man. So there's a part of me that almost wants to get orange chicken to tell people that they are. Yeah. But then do we, or do we get something different that we haven't had before? You know, you'd rather have a signature dish that is extraordinary and, and delicious than, you know, so I think we need, we definitely need some orange chicken. I agree, and it's one of those dishes that maybe, every, I mean, everybody orders orange chicken at home when they get their takeout. This is not your local orange chicken. This is something that sort of elevates the dish above and beyond. I think we should get it because I think it's also... I keep coming back to the idea that a lot of this food is comfort food, and it is. So let's give it a whirl. There's a little teeny tiny part of me that wants to order another noodle dish. I won't, just because I know we won't finish it and I can have it tonight. 
at midnight, but I won't do that. All right, so we know what we're going to get. You guys devoured. I was talking so much. You guys ate all my... You ate all the buns and... So, um, um, so did you. Okay, so I think for our entrees, um, we have to obviously have the half rack of ribs because Morimoto. Uh, the orange chicken, please. And it does come with the Chinese broccoli. If you want to do a steamed rice instead, I can substitute that. Nope, broccoli is good. Okay. Um, a buri bop. Okay. And the kids both want... Uh, they both want the... Tonkatsu? No, the ramen. This one. Right, the tonkatsu the, ramen. Right. Tonkatsu ramen. Nicholas, you want the tonkatsu ramen, correct? And so does your sister? Awesome. Oh, and look at Nicholas taking one for the team and getting the duck ramen. That a boy. Good for you. And as if on cue, the sushi comes out. Again, presentation's beautiful. It, warm, it warms the cockles of my heart. So, ladies first, please dig in. We have the eel on one side and the spicy roll. And the key with the eel is that um, there's that sweet uh, sauce that really adds such a... And, you know, people hear eel, and I think they say, well, I, I would never try it. But it, it's cooked. Um, the, the eel is it's sort of a... Um, it's almost like barbecued eel. It is exactly barbecued. And they, they put a gorgeous plum sauce on the top so that it tastes a little bit like a really lovely tuna steak and it has a little bit of a barbecue flavor to it and it has the skin on the back but the skin melts in your mouth and then the combination typically they serve eel with avocado and that's on purpose so you get that barbecue flavor with the creamy avocado and it makes a nice flavor mm. you didn't talk long I just stuffed my face <laughs> so the soft shell crab is really decadent it's it's not an a an offensive fry at all. It's a very light fry. But I also like to put a little wasabi in my um, soy sauce. So when you dip the delicious decadent soft shell crab into the soy sauce very lightly You get a little bit of the heat. You get a little bit of the heat. But the soft shell crab is, is cooked like to perfection. I love and when you're we're looking at the presentation here it actually has asparagus with it that mirrors the legs of the soft shell crab. And it's nice because you get the crispy crab legs, and then the rice is so incredibly soft on the outside, and you get a little bit of a crunch from the black and white sesame seeds on the outside. So it's really a multi-sensory experience when you're eating it, right? It's just a lovely moment. And you know, you can only get soft shell crab at a certain time of year. So whenever you can get it, I, wherever I am and they have it on the menu, I always take advantage because it's one of my favorites. So our entrees just came. The kids have already dug into their ramen. Oh, and look at that beautiful S on Q. Look at that beautiful plate of ribs. We cook for four hours on the simmer. And then toss on the cornstarch and then poison sweet chili, garnish with cilantro and chili corns. Thank you very much. Somebody needs to take a picture of that stat before. While you do that, Marion Rose, tell me how is, is your, uh, how's your monstrous bowl of ramen? Okay, so first off, the portion for this is massive. It's amazing. Plenty of ramen goodness. There is, like, from the top, there's like a giant... There are two giant slices of pork, a bunch of, like, noodles, like ramen noodles, and there's some really nice sliced ginger that's really good because it gives you that, like, refreshing, like, punch almost. And the broth isn't a traditional, like, clear ramen broth. It's almost kind of creamy, and it tastes really, really good. I think there's also some, like, shrivels of mushroom and chive in there. It's really, really nice. I love it. All right, so I actually got the duck ramen, and it's a re- the ramen is really good. Like, the duck is, like, nice and tender, and it, like, has, like, this really nice flavor that's not too salty. And if you put a little bit of soy sauce in it, it, like, finish it up, finishes it off. It's re- really good. Excuse me. So the instructions, um, you better don't finish those because I need to try some. Uh, we just had our table side preparation and really presentation 
of the um, the Buribap, the Korean style yellowtail rice bowl. Again, I like the little bit of, of show that comes along with it. Um, I have not tried it yet. Ladies, you're almost <laughs> done with your portion. Oh, yeah. And the one thing that was really beautiful is our, our waiter came over, presented a table side, and the fish is on top with this gorgeous egg yolk. And he mixes it up. He actually told us that this was what Morimoto won Iron Chef Japan with. or um, And that slow process of mixing in the egg yolk actually makes it emulsify and gets super creamy. This rice is it's almost like a like an Asian style risotto, right? It's a gorgeous texture to it. And then this bowl, which I'm afraid to even touch, they said it was 450 degrees. They sear the hamachi on the sides of the bowl and then put it back on the top of the creamy rice. So you get this gorgeous sear on one side and then hamachi is something you can also eat raw on sushi so you get that combination plus the creamy rice and it's an outstanding flavor and what I love about hamachi you know people hear hamachi if you don't know what it is sometimes you're just afraid to order it because you're but it is a very non fishy very very light fish right it's one of those things like if you like if you like tuna you get a really lovely flavor to it it has a really nice um, texture it's a little bit thicker it has a nice if you like something like lobster or mugfish if you like that sort of toothsome quality to it it has that it's very smooth it's not offensive or fishy as you said in any way but I think paired with the way the rice is prepared it's just it, it is it almost creates like an orzo kind of feeling yes. with regards to the fish next it's just it, it's a great compliment to the way that the, the rice is prepared and it's a huge portion too so the buribap comes in at $30 Three of us are sharing this, and there still is a lot left in there. We also have, uh, you guys already started on the orange chicken. Thoughts, ladies? So it's really good. It's Again, it's unlike like a, just a normal orange chicken that you could get from a, food court or, from a food court or a local Chinese restaurant. You can really taste like the orange, and it's topped with like sesame seeds, and it has some... I don't know what this is called. This green-looking stuff that's really good. Bro- oh, it's broccoli. There you go. Japanese broccoli. Japanese broccoli. But whatever it is, it's delicious. Yeah. So the way it's um, it's um, presented is there's about six to eight pieces of the orange chicken. And there's a lovely portion of this Japanese broccoli that is sautéed. It probably is sautéed with some olive oil and garlic. So the garlic, Chinese, Chinese broccoli, Chinese broccoli. Um, and you know, I, being an Italian, I love garlic. So anything cooked in garlic and oil, I could eat forever and ever and ever. I could bathe in it, and it would be just fabulous. But um, TMI, but okay. Yeah. So, but the as my daughter said, the chicken is lightly uh, pan fried, and you can really taste the essence of orange come through on the delicious coating that they put on it. It says in the menu, it's, they specify their Florida oranges. And you're right, that, that sense of sweetness that isn't overpowering. Right. It's a nice little hint on top. And because it almost doesn't even taste like it's fried. It doesn't. And it's one of those things, it's more aromatic than it is sweet and sticky. It kind of hits you before you eat it. Um, and it's one of those things where it's a great dish to share. I mean, again, you could order this for one person, but it's a wonderful way for each person around the table because of the portion size. Everybody can have a little taste of it and get that wonderful crunch sensation. The sesame seeds have a great texture. And then just another note about that broccoli. The way that they cut it, they actually cut the stem lengthwise, which is a cross. So you get these long, lovely strips of broccoli, almost like you're eating green beans, I guess. Um, so it's a really great texture, too, um, next to the chicken. Yeah, this is nice. And I'm surprised that the ribs have sat here so long without you touching Ladies, please, dig right in. Don't be shy. Don't even use your fork, Deanna. Just use your fingers. That's exactly the way Morimoto intended it. So the, what Deanna was saying earlier about these ribs, they're, they're cooked low and slow first, and then they're deep fried a second time. So the, the first one sort of renders the fat out of it. The second, the second cooking cuts that moisture, so you get this crispy skin. I'm looking at it right now, and I literally am mesmerized, right? It, it draws me in. And I know as soon as I eat it, it's just going to get crispy and delicious, and I'm so excited. Nicholas, what do you think? These ribs are such good ribs. They fall out right off the bone. They're nice and sweet, and the fry is like, 
it's not even a fry, it's like a skin. It's like a like a tiny layer of food. So let me ask you, are these the best ribs? Because we've had literally world-class ribs from a, a place in, in South Florida that, that won, continues to win national competitions. Are these, and it, they're, although they're different, are these the best ribs you think you've ever had? By far. Yeah. Yeah? Ever. Best ribs ever. And the sweet chili sauce with the crunch. And then it's not too porky where... <laughs> you say it's not too porky. Right, where sometimes you eat pork and it tastes very, let's just say farm forward, right? Like there's sometimes when you have pork, you want a little bit of that pork flavor, but this you get the flavor and then the texture and the sweet. And it's uh, it's one of those things, again, they have cilantro on top and then these little chili fronds, yeah. which look like the stamen of flowers, but they're not. It's, it's a dried chili. It's not hot, but it just adds a gorgeous crunch and texture to it. It's really quite, it's addictive. They're phenomenal. I, like, I cannot, every time I come here, I say I'm not going to get the ribs again, but you can't help, you can't get away from it because they're so good. The ribs, like, you, they're really good ribs, but they're completely different from other ribs. They're, like, these ribs, like, have, like, a light, like, fry rather than, like, South Florida ribs that, like, ha- that don't even have a fry at all, that mostly are, like, just pure pork and bone like so you can't really compare them they're com- two completely different like type of food to me I, I love the way that they're cooked because they literally fall off the bone like some people will be like oh yeah these ribs fall off the bone blah 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 these literally fall off of the bone and they're cooked I mean, their bone perfectly Something. Your bone looks like something out of, out of a cartoon. Like you stuck it in your mouth and all you pulled out was a bone? Because there's nothing left on it. But I will tell you... It's, remember, it's, it's, it's exactly how I remember it. There's certain restaurants you go to and they have absolute, they have signature dishes. This is one of his signature dishes. And this is one that, it doesn't matter when you come, you have to get the ribs. And I'll tell you, I just tried some of Marion's ramen. That's delicious. That is so... And look how much is left too, which I'm so excited about. The other thing, too, about the ribs, would you all order one of these for yourself? I mean, I think it's the perfect sharing dish. I don't know that I would eat this all by myself. It would be too much. But it's, again, it's it's the ultimate social dish because everybody digs in. I'm watching everybody around this table, specifically you right now. Lou, you look like you're in absolute heaven. You're going to lick your fingers. Right? All of us have our fingers holding up. We're enjoying it. And, and right, I mean, the fall off the bone, we keep echoing that same sentiment. I wish we could have smell-o-vision right now, too, because, again, it's that sweet, that crispy, the fatty. I mean, it hits all the notes. It hits all the notes. And that's, I think the crispiness, that little bit of a, the, the texture from the crisp is what separates it from getting ribs, uh, for example, somewhere else. These ribs are very good, and, like, they're fry. I don't even, like, I said this before, it's not really a fry. It's more of this, like, a layer of, like, crisp. Yes. Like a seal. How do you like your ramen? I like your duck ramen. My duck ramen is very, very good. The duck is very tender. It's a very like nice meat. If if, if you put a little bit of soy sauce inside the soup with like the broth, it's really, really good. And it gives it the right amount of salt. The duck can be a little gamey. Is it gamey at all, or does it taste like? Is it very smooth and soft? It's. It's a little chewy, but it's still really smooth and soft. The other thing, oh, we're watching Loon right now. Try the duck. And I listen, ramen is not necessarily shareable, but I'll make it. I came, just literally got up and came to the other side of the table so I can try the duck. So if it's worthy to get up to the other side of the table to try it, I think that's that's evidence alone that it's really good. And the ramen looks really lovely and toothsome. What was the texture of the noodle? It's like, it's just like ramen. It's just like delicious noodle heaven spaghetti ramen noodles. This ramen is basically like the ramen you get from the food store, but better. It, the broth, I was really surprised because the duck ramen, it's like a normal ramen clear broth, but I was actually pretty surprised because I've never seen, uh, I guess you could say it's like an opaque 
creamy broth in a ramen before, which was in mine. Mine was the pork. And it was delicious with the ginger, with the mushroom. There was even a half of a, like a hard-boiled egg in there. And it, with, the, with the pork, like this fatty, delicious pork, it was so good. So I want to give some honorable mention because we've had some really good combinations here. Deanna and I just ordered the mango matcha cocktail with lychee in it. And I had that right after eating the pork ribs. So you have this sweet chili sauce on the outside. And then you get that kind of pine-scented quality to mango and then the sweet lychee nut afterwards. This is a great... uh, Sometimes I just have cocktails before dinner, but this is a great cocktail to go with your food. I'm really enjoying that. And then I had a bite of the, the tonkatsu ramen here, too. The, the broth is creamy. The noodles are, are al dente, which are absolutely gorgeous. And they're actually, this might be a funny conversation to make, but they are the right length where you're not feeling like you're slurping them and getting your face entirely covered. And was it you who told me last time we were here about the way, about yes. eating the eating of noodles that I did not know before? Right, so you're not supposed to eat your noodles and bite them. You're supposed to slurp them entirely at one time. Like, if, if here in the United States, if we were to pick up a piece of steak and bite it and let it drop down to our plate, it would be rude. So the same way that when you're in Japan or when you're in China and you eat noodles, you eat the entire thing, even if you're slurping up. So take a small bite of noodle versus taking a giant uh, a giant wad of them and letting them fall back into the bowl. So that's considered pretty rude if you bite them off and do it that way. I've been doing it wrong all along. I just had some of the pork. Again, it's it's sliced really thin. It's super tender. Uh, you're almost able to separate it just with the chopsticks alone. And of all the stuff that you know we've been eating a lot, we've been here for a long time. Nothing is very heavy. No. Like I don't feel like we ate anything that was was really heavy. Even with the fried on the the ribs and the fry on the the chicken, some of the other things. Even the the. Um, the spider roll, nothing to... I don't even know if you can... I mean, I, I know it's deep fried, but it's almost like a seared texture more than a deep fried. Like, it's such a light fry that it's not overbearing in any way. When something's fried properly, it shouldn't absorb the oil. It, the oil should just cook the outer the outer edge of it. And so it doesn't, it doesn't taste oily, right? It, not at all. It tastes light and crispy and a gorgeous texture. Yeah. Oh, and it's got a little bit of that sweet fattiness of the pork... And you're right, this, you know, you're not used to seeing ramen in almost a, a, a creamy type right. of a sauce. Right, I think that's part of the egg in there too. So that egg cooks low and slow, and it's almost like, uh, like a continental, like French style preparation where it just makes it that rich, creamy sauce to the noodles. It's like a, like, again, I feel like it's like an Asian carbonara a little bit. And I'm just like, happy that there's still a lot more food left over for us. You would think with all that food, and I'm so excited about my giant bag of leftovers that we get to take home, evidencing just how much food you get for your money, I think we would be remiss if we did not go through and order something off the dessert menu, which, um, again, is somewhat extensive. There are about eight or so different items. There's a churro fondue, which has house-made churros, Nutella, and whipped cream, chocolate cream and crunch, Oreo tempura, which means fried Oreo, <laughs> mandarin orange jelly, dark chocolate gelato, hazelnut chocolate crunchies, mochi mochi, which is onion tofu, coconut mango soup, fruit boba, frozen mango, and lemon yogurt powder, cream caramel, a melon cream soda float, and your choice of a gelato or sorbetto tria of the chef's selection of the day. All those run about 8 to $13.00. We unanimously, and by unanimous, I mean me and Kristen, said we're going to get the chocolate cream and crunch, which again is presented beautifully. Yeah, I want to try to paint this picture for you. So I'm looking at a gorgeous white porcelain tea-sized bowl, and underneath the the waitress explained to us that there's a chocolate pudding that has been um, firming up underneath of this absolutely gorgeous local orange gelée. And I love the word gelée. It's like a fancy word of saying jelly. But it's like a um, it's like a glass pool on top, and then it has what looks like a chocolate uh, granola, and then this beautiful. Do you know what that shape is called there? So it's called a quenelle. 
and it's the way that they shape the ice cream between two spoons and they roll it multiple times and you get this little shape called it's a quenelle and it just makes it look really fancy it's it's a fancy way of saying scoop oh, it's a little chocolate egg bro. <laughs> it's, it, and that's how you get the egg shape so you kind of roll it in the it's not even melting it's not melting right and then they have little Johnny Jump Ups here and little Yuzu Lees which are, are beautiful um, and all edible too I love serving flowers that you can I'm sorry a Johnny Jump Up yeah, that's the that's the name of that flower. It's called a Johnny Jump Up. They actually have a like a little cucumbery flavor. I thought that was some like funny main name for like chocolate sprinkles or something. You know, some call them like Jimmy. Some people call them sprinkles. Oh, well, they have Johnny Jump Ups on them. It's a flower. It is a flower. It looks a little bit like a violet, um, but I think it you know it was probably named in another era, like the Victorian era, right? Is it eatable? Edible? It is eatable. It's quite lovely. It has a little bit of crunch. So I can't wait to dig in because we want to see the layers. Deanna, you should like poke all the way through so we can get the chocolate. Oh, look at that. All the way down. Look at that. Mmm. So and nobody's even touched the Oreo yet, but I, I will go. I'm not going to eat the Johnny Jumper or whatever it's called. That little crunchy topping is delicious. Oh. What is that crunchy topping? So it's a chocolate granola, but let me. it tastes a little bit like... A really smooth Milky Way. Like, I'm getting this kind of candy bar quality to it. It's so Wait, let's, nice. Let's pull it over closer to us. Forget about kids. Don't try this at home. I just Not- want a bite of the flower. It's so good. I ate the whole flower. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah, delicious. Wait. Hold the phone. The Johnny Jump Up is good. The crunch is like a caramelly crunch. It, it It's not hard as a rock like what I thought. It, granola. It gives way. It's almost got like a Rice Krispie treat. Yes, that's what I was wow, like that is a, outstanding. Like Marion, I'm not listening to you. Get your Can grubby. You? Wait, stop. Marion's eating the huh? Johnny Jump Pants. <laughs> gives it a nice, a nice zing. It does, a right? Nice fresh cucumber. Right, exactly. It's got a little. And you're, you're eating the fried Oreo. Most... All of it's good. I'm gonna have a tiny right now. Go ahead, break. Go ahead. You guys try the fried Oreo. Oh. I'm gonna distract you from that All with right. this. The Oreo, while delicious, is kind of secondary to this heaven that's in the bowl right here. It's lovely, but this is a star. And I, I mean, how many? We're, there are five of us around this bowl right now. This is a lovely shareable dessert. Oh yeah. Wait, I could never, I could never eat all that by yeah. myself. Okay, Nicholas, you haven't heard one iota from him. No. Because he is in the corner, eating all the churros, dipping them himself in the corner, mm. loving life. How's your churro? How is the churro? Wait, I'm keeping something. Oh, you, is that Nutella left over? Because bring that over here. Yes, it is Nutella, and I stick my fingers in it, so <laughs> so no one would eat it. Nicholas, you know what? I would normally prevent you from sticking your fingers in your food like that, but I think because it's Nutella. Yeah. Look, I have a rule in the kitchen. The hand makes the best spatula, yes. and the finger makes the best squeegee. When you're on your plate and you want to get that last bit... And you're amongst friends and family. I fully support the use of the big yeah, Note go. to self, I'll probably never eat over at your house <laughs> if you're cooking. But, <laughs> so, and I say this all the time, I'm not normally a sweet guy, but that's really, Are you eating the it's last delicious. Thing? No, I don't, this is my first crunchy. No, don't eat them all. It is, it's really lovely. It's chewy. It has that sort of melt-away quality like a crispy treat. And the orange is not overpowering at all. It's a really nice combination to that milk chocolate pudding that's underneath that is so incredibly decadent. There's no, there are no lumps in that pudding. No, you know what I love? If you really think about it, every single portion of the meal that we've had from drinks to appetizers to main courses, there is some kind of citrus hint yes. that accents everything. And I love that fresh, you know, over that fresh feel, feeling. I got it. Right? I got it. Yeah. I think that um, it's something that I'd love to learn more about where you want to bring um, the combination of aromatics to the food, right? Um, Where you want to have um, that orange that gives you that lovely, fresh, invigorating aroma, and then you dig into the rich, gorgeous texture of the chocolate underneath. And that's something that I notice in a lot of Asian cuisine. You try to balance all of those notes, like sweet, salty, fatty, um, meaty, and then umami too, which is, I think, a really interesting concept that we're all getting into. And umami is that whole mouth feel, right? That wonderful sensation you get when you have, you hit all of the things and you engage all of your senses. 
and I was just thinking that as I sipped my nice, warm, comforting, unsweetened green tea, like to finish off that, like I have the perfect, like, sensation in my mouth that I would like. There's nothing else I want after that. Like, this was like the ideal meal from beginning to end. And the other thing too is everything was shareable, you know. Like, and they are really like concerned with their portion control. So, for instance, the portions were not outrageously huge, but they were shareable enough to the point where you weren't, you never felt like you were overeating, even if you did order a meal to yourself. But I, you know, as you said that, I looked down at the giant bag of leftovers next to me. So very excited about me and my stretchy pants and my couch and my Netflix and my Morimoto leftovers. Marion, if you wanted to sum up your meal, your experience here at Morimoto, uh, how sort of wrap it up for me? It was a culinary adventure. My taste buds went through all the different textures and flavors of Asia. All right, so how does Morimoto... Because we're, we're locals, right? And we really... We eat at, at Disney often. We come to Disney Springs more than we do the parks. Where does Morimoto rank for you among some of your favorite restaurants on property? Well, it's definitely one of the top, although... I'm very much into comfort food. I can understand how this brings in the comfort element with the ramen and just all the different flavors and textures all go together so nicely. So it's definitely up there on my restaurant. Nicholas, tell me about your tell. Wrap up your meal for me and tell me how does Morimoto rank among the Disney Springs or Disney World restaurants for you? Among the Disney Springs, it's in the top. It's in the top five. In the in Disney World, it's in the top ten because. It's a very nice restaurant that's like that has sort of like a comfort like feel that you like feel I don't know how to explain. You feel like it's nice and like smooth. And You're ready for a nap now, aren't you? Yeah, <laughs> like comfort. Mrs. Mangello? So I honestly think that there are comfort aspects to the meal, but I think it was more of a refreshing meal. As I said, the citrus that they add in every aspect of from uh, the drinks to the appetizers to the main courses, I think that it really adds like this feeling of not you're not overfilled with anything. So that uh, Morimoto has always been one of my favorites. So it ranks up there. Thank you very much, Kristen. So uh, for me, this is a place where I feel comfortable bringing anybody. Um, I could bring somebody who I would be worried about whether they were an adventurous eater or people who have eaten around the world. I feel like everybody could get something here and be extremely happy. I love the consistency that's here, too, where there's never been a, a miss. It's always been a hit. Um, and again, there are foods here that I crave. I mean, those ribs are something that... I'm going to go home. I'm going to think about those ribs. I'm going to dream about those ribs. And I'm going to look at pictures of those ribs on my phone and can't wait to plan my next dinner here. And that's the way that I feel about it. So, And it's been a pleasure, too, to um, spend time with other food lovers because we talk about it. The passion level rises at the table. We get excited. And you're with kindred spirits. And I love that. Yeah, we all sort of looked at each other at different times. Like we all were smiling and like wanted to just hug each other because we were enjoying it so much. Look, I, I've said this before. Um, what I one of the things I love about this restaurant is you can come here for a casual lunch. You can come here in the evening in your shorts to share appetizers. I would be if you were coming out for a date night. You can get dressed up if you're coming out with business associates. You can do it as well. You can sit upstairs in the sushi bar. You can rent out the the um, the private room and the forbidden lounge upstairs. You can come in here without a reservation, sit at the lounge downstairs or upstairs and order off the entire menu. We didn't even talk about the street food location right outside, which is a great place to get a different menu and some casual items. And upstairs, outside, is absolutely beautiful. Um, that rooftop deck with the popcorn lights overlooking uh, Disney Springs and the water is, for, is, to me, one of the best views out there. I think you guys hit it on the head. It's... The food is both comforting yet light enough. Um, it's shareable if you're so inclined to share, which normally I'm not unless I'm doing a live review. Um, but it's a place as locals we don't just come to for like we come here often. Like it's a place that we come back to and as 
you know, when I have friends come down, it's a place that I like to, to bring friends as well. We should note they do take Tables in Wonderland and annual pass discounts. Tables in Wonderland will give you a discount uh, if you have any alcoholic beverages. So you got that going for you. Uh, I want to know from you, the listener who is sitting right next to me in this invisible chair, have you ever been to Morimoto Asia here in Disney Springs? If so, what do you think? And if you haven't, please come down and give it a try. And if you don't want to come alone, I'm like 10 minutes away. Just hit me up on Messenger. Uh, Mangello family, thank you guys as always for being here. Kristen Furman Simmons, they can not only find you obviously on the WW Radio blog where you can talk about some of the things you write there, but where else can they find you online, on social, et cetera, et cetera? Certainly. So if you are into food like me, you can follow me on Instagram, which is my favorite social media platform. It's at Calf Cooks. So it's letter K, letter A, letter F. C-O-O-K-S and I post a lot of my food adventures there especially with my family and all the things that I love to eat Um, a lot of that has to do with Disney but a lot of it also has to do with my travels around the country and also into Canada Um, and then you can find me at kristensimmons.com where I love food storytelling I love to hear how people get engaged with food I teach um, at the University of Southern Maine and my classes are always online and some of those things are available to the public too so if you like to tell food stories uh, if you think that you have an interesting angle about food I'd love to to hear from you because it's something that gets me really excited and I'm so happy to share that with you and your family and that's listen that's what it is about I'll obviously put links to all that stuff in the show notes over at www.radio.com but I think you're right it's you know we are all storytellers we gather around the fire we gather around the table to share stories and share meals and this is where some of our not just our best meals but our best best memories are made thank you for joining me thank you the listener for joining us as well Uh, so until next time uh, Domo Arigato Mr. Roboto that's right Domo Arigato and thank you so much for this chocolate pudding heaven 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 Thank you. Good night, America. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Have a good life. Stay hungry. Stay hungry. Oh, they just wait a minute. Let's start all over again. They just brought out the giant tower of seafood. Round two, my friends. <laughs> Let's go. We, there has to be. You know what? They need to add a stretchy pants store in Disney Springs. Oh, That's like the Tower of Heaven. I want to climb that tower. <laughs> It's one, two, it's four stories. I'm going to go eat with those guys. You guys going to finish that? They're going to take it down. Look at that crowd. They're young. They're, they're like, you know, teenage boys. They're hugging the chef. They're hugging, the chef came out. They're hugging the chef. They're going to make that happen. It's raw seafood of all different types, plus sashimi. Time for our Walt Disney World trivia question of the week, where I invite you to test your knowledge of Walt Disney World's history or see how well you pay attention to the details, sometimes in what you see, sometimes in what you hear, maybe even in what you taste. If you think you know the answer, you can enter via our online form for a chance to win a prize package. Before we get to this week's question, we're going to go back, review last week's, and select our winner. So last week, I brought us over to Epcot Center, where there are are some rumors of some things that may or may not be changing in the next couple of months or years. And one of the places that I wanted to go was Ellen's Energy Adventure slash Universe of Energy, and specifically in one scene, because when Ellen and Bill, Nye the science guy, are in the helicopter, Ellen asks Bill for a very unique and very seemingly unnecessary item. And your question last week was to tell me, what was the item that Ellen asks for while she's in the hel- in the helicopter with Bill Nye, the science guy. Well, again, thanks to the hundreds of you who entered, got this one correct. You were even quoting the attraction and some of your favorite scenes from the attraction. And in this uh, dream sequence where Ellen is in the helicopter, she is blow drying her hair because they just learned that hydroelectric power plants convert the energy of falling water into electricity. Ellen asks him about some of the pros and cons of 
the hydroelectric power and some of the different types of energy. And he says that right now, renewable power provides about 10% of the world's energy. And she says, well, that's great, Bill, but we still need a heck of a lot more energy. Where's it coming from? And oh, do you have a curling iron? And that was the answer I was looking for. Ellen asked Bill for a curling iron. I took all of the correct entries, hundreds of them that got it correct, and randomly selected one. And again, last week, you were playing for the 102 Ways to Save Money for an At Walt Disney World book, all seven of my virtual audio tours of the Magic Kingdom, both of which, by the way, are available at www.radio.com and amazon.com, a WW Radio Magic Band 2.0 cover, some stickers, and the brand spanking new WW Radio Pop Socket, which is that expanding stand and grip and mount for your phone. So last week's winner, randomly selected, is Philip McDonald. So, Philip, I have your shipping information. I will get your prize package out to you right away. If you played last week and didn't win, that's okay, because here's your your next chance to enter in this week's simple Walt Disney World Trivia Challenge. So, I am a nostalgic. Uh, I've recently been working on something uh, in the parks that brought me into uh, one of my favorite attractions still to this day, which has not changed in nearly 40-some-odd years And that is the Country Bear Jamboree. I think we're all pretty familiar with most of the major characters and players in the Country Bear Jamboree. But tell me, what's the name of the raccoon on Henry, the host's head, in the Country Bear Jamboree? It's that simple. I just need the name of the raccoon. You have until Sunday, Father's Day, June 18th. Don't forget about Dad. At 11.59 p.m. to go to www.radio.com. Go to podcast and then show number 486. Use the online form there to enter your name, answer, and mailing address. So if you are selected, I can get your prize package out to you right away. So good luck and have fun. That's going to do it for this week's show. Thank you again so much for joining me at the table at More Moto this week and every week here on the show. Please don't forget to visit www.radio.com. You can download my new free book, 102 Things to Do at Walt Disney World at least once. Listen to past episodes. Check out our blog from our amazing team of writers, including Kristen Simmons, who was on this week. New videos, the logo store, the running team, and more. Also, don't forget to like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash radio. There you'll not only find unique content, but that's where I'd like you to go to continue the conversation and really be part of the community. And speaking of being part of the community and keeping these conversations going, I am at Lou Mangello on Twitter, Pinterest, Instagram, and on Facebook as well. And of course, don't forget to like the Facebook page at facebook.com slash Radio. If you have a question you want answered on the air, you can email me, lou at www.radio.com, or call the voicemail, be heard on the air, at 407-900-9391. I hope to have the opportunity to meet you and thank you in person, hopefully at a meet of the month upcoming every month in Walt Disney World at one of our future events like our Alaska cruise in 2018, some of our running team events. You can join the WWE running team, whether you walk, run, walk, jog, or just cheer, as well as other meetups that I do on the road. As I travel to speak at conferences and schools, I'll often do meetups on the road And maybe if I can help you by presenting at your conference, event, or school, I create very engaging and entertaining, uh, real-world, actionable strategies for entrepreneurs and businesses and executives, employees, and students alike. I custom tailor them to your audience, to your event, and it's everything from the Disney difference, sort of achieving the ultimate customer experience, leadership lessons learned from Walt, taking the leap of faith, social media, live video, podcasting, and so much more. If you visit loumangelo.com, you can find out more about how I can maybe help you by coming to present at your event or by working with you with some personal mentoring or small group coaching. Again, you can find everything at loumangelo.com. Don't forget that I am hosting a Momentum event, which is a weekend workshop, a two-day weekend workshop in Walt Disney World, October 14th through the 17th, as well as an optional third mastermind day as well. The uh, workshop is limited to just 50 people. There are now less than 20 seats available and only two seats left for the mastermind. I'm going to announce some of the speakers soon. Of course, you know, if you listen to past episodes, that Duncan Wardle, the former vice president of Disney uh, Innovation and Creativity, is going to be one of our speakers there in a very uh, informative, entertaining, and more importantly, a very uh, interactive uh, workshop to help you turn what you love 
into what you do. Again, for more information, visit LouMangelo.com. Thanks, as always, to Mouse Fan Travel, my official and recommended travel provider, and little Timmy Foster over at CelebrationsPress.com. I also want to thank some of the new and longtime members of the WW Radio Nation family, including some longtime members like Melanie Jones, Mark Recchio, Nicole Ostrowski, Amy Ferguson, John J. Smith, and Nikki Keller. And if you want to not only help the show but also get exclusive rewards every month, including scavenger hunts, access to our private Facebook group, personalized magic band covers, logo gear, t-shirts, monthly care packages from Walt Disney World, exclusive live video group calls and more, you can visit www.radio.com support. And as always, my friend, and you are my friend, whether we have met yet or not, all I ask is that if you like the show, please help spread the word, let others know about it, Tweet out a link to this or your favorite or a past episode. Better yet, share it on Facebook, on your profile, on your page, or in if you're on a a Disney group that you think might enjoy it as well. And please, if you can, take 30 seconds to rate and review the show over on iTunes. Thanks to you, we have more than 1,200 five-star reviews. We hit number two overall on iTunes. I want to thank some recent reviewers like D32Willis, who says the show brings the magic to you. COG007 from the UK says it is the perfect podcast for Disney fans. Lou and the assortment of stellar featured guests never fail to deliver a professional and thoroughly entertaining show every week. Or Lou's love for all things Disney makes W Radio the best Disney podcast out there. And the podcast is especially perfect for us UK based Disney fans, keeping us up to date on all the current in and out news of Walt Disney World whilst simultaneously learning from Lou's encyclopedic knowledge. Wow, about the company's history, the park's hidden treasures, and, of course, the best places to eat. Keep up the great work, Lou. Cog007, thank you. Angry user, exclamation point, 4676. Doesn't sound too angry because he said it's an awesome podcast for Disney info of all kinds. I'm a current listener, currently working my way through old episodes and can't get enough. Disney fans and people who love the parks should definitely listen All the Disney history, park information, and recommendations presented in the podcast are helpful and fun to listen to. Wow, you're the most non-angry user I've ever met. And Mike22073 says, awesome, man. The podcast is a must. If you are a Disney fan, it will increase your enjoyment of your trip to Disney tenfold. Lou is just awesome. Thank you. You're awesome, too. Don't just just don't listen to the podcast if you're hungry. That definitely holds true this week. Uh, If you want to... Find out how to leave a review or direct link to iTunes. Just visit www.com slash iTunes. And finally, thank you again so very much for giving the, the gift and the blessing of your time, which as I understand and know is your most valuable commodity. If there's anything that I can ever do to help you, please let me know. And whatever that thing is that you are endeavoring to do or dreaming to do or about to start taking that first step to do, Um, I was inspired by what I saw and heard and experienced in Pandora a couple weeks ago, where, as they say, Sivako, rise to the challenge. I hope you can find it in you to rise to your challenges. And if I can help you, please let me know. I hope that you have your very best week ever. So until next time, see ya. Hey, Lewis. Jim Meeker calling from the Magic Kingdom. First day in the park as a local and uh, sitting in the rain. So <laughs> it's been going fun now. And the girls are climbing up to the family up the treehouse and uh, just rode cars to the Caribbean. So life is good. Have a great week, Lou. Bye. Hey, Lou. How's it going? It's Brian Rainey again from Kansas City. Just want to let you know where I am. I'm at Epcot. It's Wednesday, June 7th. And I'm just sitting right in front of the sweet shop in Germany, and you can smell it from over here. That's one of the best smelling places on on property. But about time to go. My plane leaves in about five hours, so I guess it's got to come to an end sometime. But had another good time, and again, Pandora was, was absolutely amazing. And can't wait to get back there. Can't wait to get back here anywhere on Disney property. But I'm sure I'll be back. But anyway, um, I guess it's time to. Go home and be responsible, I guess. But I'd like to end this trip with another public service announcement. So here we go. Hope I don't mess this up. It looks like Br'er Fox and Br'er Bear are causing some commotion downstream. Please stay in your boats while we take care of things. 
Your visit to Splash Mountain will resume in just a bit. Hi, Lou. This is Stacy. I'm an avid listener of the podcast. Uh, I listen all the time, and I'm a Disney Parks enthusiast, as is my wife, Cora. Um, I just wanted to call because yesterday we celebrated two years of marital bliss at the parks, and even though I tried to surprise my wife, I, I think just by being in the parks, uh, even I was surprised uh, by various things. Um, the biggest surprise for my wife was a preview of Pandora, the world of Avatar, and uh, the entire area is just spectacular. I I have not personally seen Avatar, but I told my wife, like, this is the kind of experience, you know, from the floating mountains to the Navi River ride and the, the flights of passage, that that made my wife cry all the happy tears. Um, <laughs> that just makes those who have n- not seen um, the movie Avatar feel like you know, they should go out and see it, you know. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so, and there are other surprises for us uh, through the rest of the day. Um, we spent it at Magic Kingdom. Um, but simply because we were wearing our buttons, you know, the happily ever after buttons, um, we went to the last floor, and wouldn't you know it, Buddy Boyle did what I've been trying to do for the last two years. He read my wife's mind through it with his telepathetic powers. <laughs> it was it was amazing, um, and just other little things, you know, during the uh, fan- festival of fantasy parade, Captain Hook spotted us on the starboard side and uh, formed his hand in a hook in the shape of a heart toward us. So that was really cool. Um, so many more things happened. I can't even begin to recall or recount because it was just because of our buttons that we were wearing. So that was really cool. And uh, one other aspect I almost forgot to mention, we bound it. Uh, I was Prince Charming and uh, my wife was Cinderella. So it was nice to see even little girls look up at my wife with the same kind of awe that I look at her with, with every day that um, she's been in my life. So just wanted to share that and hope that any couple celebrating remembers to wear your buttons and be open to whatever's going to come, you know, when you're in the parks. So uh, thank you, Lou, for uh, putting on this show. And uh, my dream is to someday co-host a top ten segment maybe with you and uh, little Timmy Foster. So maybe if I wear the right button, hey, it could happen, right? <laughs> Hey, Lou, this is Jay. Uh, I am a new listener to the podcast and uh, just wanted to drop you a note and say that, uh, hey, I just finished my first fact or fiction uh, podcast. Really enjoyed it. So what I'm doing, I'm kind of working backwards, going from the – now, you keep saying don't listen to episode one. You said that in two podcasts lately, uh, and i got to say, you say it twice, and I've got to go listen to it. And I did, and I'm not – it wasn't. It wasn't bad. I don't really know what you're talking about. Um, I enjoyed it. So uh, anyway, just want to drop you a note. I, I did send you an email of, about you know wanting to talk with you, um, and I hope to do that soon. But uh, anyway, just wanted to drop you this line and, and say thanks. Uh, I kind of feel like uh, finding this podcast and finding you and listening to your, your guests and all that, it's kind of like I'm a, an, an alien who's been like living in this world of – uh, other people and I've found I'm getting transmissions from my mothership now and uh and so anyway that's what it's what it's like to to have found this podcast and and I feel like um I've kind of uh, I've found a group of my people a new group of my people um anyway enjoying this show appreciate you hope to talk to you soon and maybe meet you someday all right bye you got a friend in me Yeah! <laughs> yeah! Fist bump! Fist bump is not in my fighting database. No, this this isn't a fighting thing. It's what people do sometimes when they're excited or pumped up. Ba-la-la-la.